from last Sunday's chapter in Luke to today's chapter 15, we have come across more and more of the parables of Jesus in our daily readings as we have been following along our reading plan of the four Gospels in three months. Now, when we read through Matthew and Mark earlier, we did see some parables, but not as many as in this Gospel of Luke. And when we get to John, we'll say, where do the parables go? There's no, there are no parables recorded in the Gospel of John. But the use of parables was one of the ways Jesus taught the disciples and would-be followers, how he taught the crowds who were following him. And with these teaching moments, Jesus was able to teach concepts and teach about the kingdom of heaven, what the kingdom of heaven was about and what kingdom living was to be about. He was able to utilize everyday examples like seeds and pearls and nets and weeds and children and certainly everyday situations to share spiritual truths in a way that people could understand and relate to them. Jesus understood his context extremely well, and so he used what was familiar, and he also used humor and a shock value to capture the attention of those listening. Several of the parables were lessons aimed at the religious leaders who were none too happy with him. They were most likely not great fans of these parables, as they realized when Jesus would offer these parables to them, they were about them in their positions, in their attitudes, and their thoughts. Though we love the parables today, we often miss the humor, and we are not as shocked as those early first-time hearers of when Jesus first spoke these words. We're either not shocked because we've heard the parables before, or we're just so far removed from the original context that we don't realize just how direct he was and how absurd some of these examples really are to those who heard them. I, I just read the first two parables in Luke 15. I didn't see any of you throw your hands up in disbelief. I, I didn't see anyone make a, a dash for the door and, and not return in protest of this teaching of Jesus. Jesus tells two stories in which the God figure is a shepherd, and then a woman. Now, chances are we've seen positive images of, of a shepherd because of our familiarity with Psalm 23 that begins, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Or, or from the Gospel of John, where we hear Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. However, most people at that time would not have had positive images of a shepherd. They were considered to be of low estate, some of the dirtiest and smelliest people around. Shepherds were good for being out in the fields, not for being with the rest of society in the towns and the villages. In the first parable in the series of parables in Luke 15, the God figure is a shepherd. And today we're like, of course God is like a shepherd who seeks out the lost sheep. And yet the early audiences would be like, there is no way. There's no way a shepherd would do that. It would take too much risk. And in the second short parable, the God figure in the story is a woman. And let's just say that got the attention of the religious leaders. They had to be fuming mad. Even today, there are many people who don't handle reference to God being like a mother filled with care and comfort and compassion, even though we have the reference of Jesus when he says, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you're not willing. The shock value of these parables continues on. In the story that follows with the prodigal son, here in that story, the father runs to greet his son, the very son who wished he were dead when he asked for his inheritance when the father was still living. That's a big no-no. And he blows it all and he comes back home and the father doesn't wait for him to come and get on bended knee and to beg for forgiveness. But when he sees him at the distance, this dad runs, runs to where his son is. And we're like, of course, of course, a parent who loves a child will run to greet him and embrace him. Yet a man showing such emotion, a man running to greet another was unheard of in Jesus' time. No man in that time would do such a thing. And this act of running reveals, however, just how lavish God's love is 
and how God seeks to pursue that which was lost. And if this is how God is, then we who are in the church are to be in mission of going to where people are and sharing the love of Christ to, to everyone. We're in good company when we expand our understanding of who is in the company and who is to be in the community of faith. Now, for today's message, I could have selected the parable of the prodigal son to attend to in Luke 15, as that is a great story and perhaps one of the most cherished of all the, all the parables. But in our time today, I'll be drawing from the two shorter stories that precede the much longer story of the prodigal son. Now, together, all three are related, and they all have the same theme of lost and being found, and then a great rejoicing that takes place when that which was lost has been rescued and recovered. For we have the lost sheep, we have the lost coin, we have the lost child, all are found, and there's to be much rejoicing in that moment. The theme of chapter 15 is actually central to the theme of the entire gospel of Luke as we see This not only in the parables in this chapter, but we see it throughout the gospel. For there are the accounts of Jesus reaching out to the lepers and to bringing them back into community. We see him reaching out to a tax collector, Zacchaeus, the most hated man in town. And he experiences the grace of Jesus and not only experiences salvation, but he's restored to community. And in the end of the story, he gives back to others and he makes amends. Luke is the gospel writer who provides the dialogue of the two criminals who were hung next to Jesus while he was there on the cross to die for the sins of us all. And even before his death, Jesus is reaching out to the immediate lost and offers grace and promises of eternal life. These stories support the way of Jesus, who would go out of his way to bring healing and salvation to another and to provide a way for those who are on the fringes of society to be welcomed back in community or to be welcomed into the community for the first time. And if this is the way of Jesus, our Jesus, and it is, this is to be our way as well. The parables in Luke 15 do not begin as many others do with a familiar the kingdom of heaven is like. It is like a treasure hidden in a field or like a net which is thrown into the sea. These parables are start a different way. These parables are directed to those who are most upset with Jesus. The, for these teachings are in direct response to those who had issue with Jesus, with the company he was keeping, with those for whom he was hanging out with and that he dared to to share table fellowship with, the tax collectors and the sinners. And when we hear of tax collectors, we're not referring to the agents who work for the Internal Revenue Service or auditors who come and do an extensive review of accounts. In biblical times, there were citizens who paid up a large sum of money to the Roman officials to pay the taxes for a particular area, and then to ensure that that person would get the money back that he had fronted, and then to make profit, he would set the price for each person to pay. And it was much higher than what was considered fair and honest. And so tax collectors were some of the most hated people in any town. In the story of Zacchaeus, we have the notion that the main reason he's up in the tree is because he's so short. And yes, that's one of the reasons, because, you know, if he were tall enough, he could look over the people when Jesus came. But he's in the tree because all the people hated him, and they were not going to allow him to have a vantage point of seeing Jesus or being seen by Jesus. He's in the tree because people don't want him there. And yet Jesus walks by. He notices Zacchaeus. And he invites himself into Zacchaeus' home and he offers Zacchaeus new life, salvation. I'm sure that there are many there in that crowd who were scratching their heads wondering, what the heck? I mean, this dirty, rotten scoundrel is the one that Jesus sought out? Does Jesus know what he's like? Does he know what he's done to our families year after year after year? You know, Jesus had a way of 
of reaching out to the lost and the least. He is often criticized for his actions and who he associated with by those who are most uncomfortable by what he's doing. How dare, how dare Jesus associate with the lowly and and keep such company? The first two verses of chapter 15 set the stage for the teaching of lost and being found. We learn that the Pharisees and the scribes, they are, they're, they're, they're not happy with Jesus. The chapter begins, now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. All of them. You know, it's one thing to have an occasional sinner experience the love and grace of Jesus, the ones who sin like we do, but, but all of them, all of them are coming near to listen to him. And the accusations continue. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Now you and I, we're familiar with the phrase, we are known by the company we keep. Now, perhaps we learn that as a young child or a teenager. We're taught that by others who want us to be very careful with whom we associate with. For it could ruin your reputation or if their behaviors that are unbecoming, sooner or later, you might pick up on some of those unbecoming behaviors. <laughs> and yet the opposite is true as well. If you surround yourself with good company, well-mannered and behaveful, you might make an incredible difference as well. And yes, there is some merit to this. I have seen people rise up to the study levels of their friends. I've also known people who've lost inhibitions when surrounded by others who've encouraged it. It works both ways. And as Christians, we do want to surround ourselves with others who can encourage us in our walk, those who have a love for Jesus. We, we want to sing with those who have a great love for Jesus. We, we want and need companions on this journey of faith because this journey, it's not easy. We need people to help pick us up as we're going in the right direction, following after the way of Jesus. And so, yes, we want to be with those who share that same kind of love and have that same kind of posture. Yet when it comes to the church, we need to be careful with the company we keep, but not in the same way we understood this, hearing such instructions from well-intentioned adults who are concerned about whom their children are hanging out with or who can negatively influence their behavior. See, our concern is that we become too exclusive and cliquish for the company we choose to keep. The company we choose to keep may just be those who are like-minded companions and people who look and act just like we do when the company we keep should always include a plus one. A nine plus one more coin. The 99 sheep plus one more to make it a hundred. Signifying completeness. See, when I hear the parables of Jesus in Luke 15, I hear them as an indictment on the church. Maybe it's because I'm a pastor, but that's what I hear. I hear as an indictment on the church today and the company we tend to want to keep. Now, I'm not like the religious leaders who were critical for the company Jesus kept. But when I hear these parables directed to religious leaders and the church, they make me wonder. They make me wonder about the company that I keep and we keep together in the church today. See, we could fall in the trap of being comfortable with the 99 and think that it's just too great a risk and effort and time to pursue the one sheep that was lost. I mean, nine coins, isn't that good enough? Nine coins is still nine coins. We're good, aren't we? We're all in good company here. Let's just take care of us and and look after one another. Isn't that what we're called to do as a church? To, To look after one another in love? 
You know, there's a tendency in the church in America to surround ourselves with the like-minded, to surround ourselves with others from the same economic backgrounds, the same political leanings, the same cultures, the same educational levels, the same kind of, of church experiences. And we naturally want to go to churches or certain worship services because we can relate to the musical interests or the styles of, of worship or the, the, the different theologies that a church might have. But we also can look for a church that will cater to our needs. You know, if we have children and youth, are there programs for our children to help them grow and in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And we want to go to a church where, where that is happening. If we're single, are, are there small groups for singles, not with the aim of matchmaking, but for the sake of honoring the fact that we're all, that there's no singleness in the household of God. You know, I could go on and on and list the various needs of the people in the church. And we might view that a successful church is one that meets the needs of its members. Spend money there. Do the resources there. Do whatever it takes to, to make the members happy and retain them at the expense of the mission of going after the one who's lost and needs to be found. Your congregational care and spiritual growth, they are important, yes. But not for the sake of forgetting why we're here. For the church has always existed for those who have yet to come. Always. Membership in the church doesn't come with privileges other than the privilege of having a sense of belonging into a community of faith that has, that has welcomed me in and encourages me to live out my baptismal call to, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. See, church, we need for the one coin, we need that one coin to be found. We need that one sheep to be rescued. Perhaps we're the ones who can be lost until the one is found. See, the 99 represents not being complete. And yet we could be comfortable with the 99. But every community of faith needs to recognize that there's always room, always, for one more. Even if that one more is a person who votes differently than you. The one who dresses differently than you. The one who is struggling to make ends meet. The one whose world has just turned on its end by hearing a spouse say, but I don't love you anymore. The one more who's just moved here from another country and is looking for a sense of community and belonging. The one who, who's just moved here to get closer to children and they're longing for community. The one more adult, young adult, who's realizing just how difficult it is to feasibly live in this area. The one more. The one more who more readily identifies with the LBGTQ community than a community of believers. Are, these are just a few of the one mores that are all around us in our community. Until we truly represent the community around us, we need to welcome the one more. And, and even when we better reflect the community around us, guess what? There's still room for the one more. See, we're missing out on our kingdom potential and we fall short of the vision of welcoming, inviting all God's children when not all God's children feel welcomed here or have been invited here. See, on any given Sunday in our time of worship, yes, there are people here in the sanctuary and there should be people who are worshiping online. There should be longtime members here as well as those who are brand new and are seeking. There should be people strong in faith and those who are filled with doubts but searching and longing. There should be a mixture of, of the saints among us as well as the sinners among us. There should have, we should have Christians who are voting and belong, maybe identify with either side of the political aisle in this church. 
There should be people of all ages. We should have people who feel comfortable in suits and dresses as well as those who come with jeans and shirts. We should have cradle Methodists as well as people from other denominations and other faiths who together try to discern what, it's, what is it going to be like to be church today? How are we going to do this thing called church? You know, we're not looking for new people to help support the church financially. Nor are we just to look for people who are different in appearance to say we've become more inclusive. You know, the gathered community who worships the Lord should look like a mixture of people who attend AA meetings, an English as second language class, those who come to Grace Ministries on Saturday morning who make up the crowd and the emergency room, waiting room on any given night, the gathering that takes place in the Sweetwater Tavern. Pick any metro car fitness center in an executive boardroom. A church in this community needs to look like the crowd at a Westfield Centerville high school football game. And I don't care which team you cheer for. <laughs> it should look like any classroom just down the road at Center Ridge Elementary. See, it takes more than a vision statement for this to become our reality, though the vision certainly helps us understand this is where we're looking to go. This is who we want to be. A welcoming congregation inviting all God's children to experience and share in Christ's transforming love. Do we not that want that for ourselves and for others? And for this vision to become our reality, it takes a willingness from you and me to reach out and seek out the one the one other, the one who is lost, the one who left, the one who feels left out, the one who's been hurt by an experience of another church or even this one, the one who's in need of the healing grace of Jesus. And it takes our willingness to hear more grumbling. And instead of giving into it, keep pressing on, not for our sake, but for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the one who's yet to come. If you're reading along in the plan this week on Monday, you have heard Jesus say, and I trust you've heard this verse before, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and daily follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. I think this works not just for the individual. I think it works for the church as a whole. We don't save the church by preservation. We don't save the church by maintaining a certain status quo or wanting to keep up appearances that we got all our stuff together and Jesus is so pleased with the cleanliness that he sees. In this day and age when the future of the church in America is uncertain and it is shifting and shifting again, perhaps we've been given the opportunity to consider how together we might change how we go about preparing for the future. Perhaps we save the life of the church by losing it, by giving it away. Focusing not only those who are here, but focusing on those who are not here. Searching for the one, the one that God so loves, the one who needs to hear not judgment and condemnation from a church, but experiencing the saving grace of Jesus from people who just left church on a mission. Imagine if we had the same urgency as the woman who searched high and low for the coin with the determination of the shepherd who just went out and had to go and rescue the lost sheep. Imagine if each of us did that. As a bishop of long ago used to conclude a sermon or his writing, he would say, it's worth pondering. Amen.